Welcome to episode 55 of the Empowering Ability Podcast. Welcome to the Empowering Ability Podcast, where we get you and your loved ones impacted by disability the information needed to live a full and meaningful life. Now here's your host, Eric Gall. Hey friends, welcome to the Empowering Ability Podcast. This is Eric Gall, your host, and we're going to get into the podcast uh, I guess in relatively short order today. So our uh, guest today, or my guest today, is Genia Steven. And we talk about how to create the good life. And I'll kind of let the secret out of the bag right away here. And uh, Gina shares with us the real key to creating the good life is through developing value roles. And what is a valued role? So a valued role is really the answer that you give when somebody asks you the question, what do you do? What do you do for a living, right? That's, that's typically one of the first questions that somebody asks you when you first meet them. First question is, what's your name? Second question, what do you do? And it's a thing that we do as humans. We judge each other in, in terms of what we do, but it also helps us to understand the other person and, and gives us context. So really starting with those value roles and letting the good things in life flow out of those values roles. So uh, Genia shares her story on how she's done this with her family and her son, Will, who has a disability. Um, so we get into that in quite a bit of depth in the second half of our conversation. In the first half of our conversation, Genia shares her story as a sibling. So she has a sibling with a disability, um, and she shares her perspectives as a mother as well. And we talk um, about Genia's mother and... Um, I want to be very upfront with this uh, here in the introduction of the of the podcast because I feel that I'm taking a bit of a, a risk with leaving some of the content that I left in in this episode because we talk about the perspective of being a mother and having a child with a disability and what that experience is is like. So we have a conversation about that. And I just want to be very upfront. I'm obviously not a mother, um, nor do I have uh, a child with a disability or any children. So um, I, I'm just cautious that I might have stuck my foot uh, in my mouth in that conversation, but I've left it in because I think that it's uh, a valuable conversation to share. So I'll p apologize in advance if you get uh, offended or uh, you feel I said something that was offensive during that conversation, but I feel it was a valuable enough conversation to leave in the podcast because I think Genia provides some valuable perspective in that conversation. Uh, a little bit more on Genia here. So professionally, Genia is a midwife uh, to many people, and she's an activist uh, for people with developmental uh, disabilities. And um, she's a recent uh, podcaster. So she started up a podcast called The Good Things in Life, and she has an online community. And you can find that at thegoodthingsinlife.org, where she, uh, she's helping young families who share that same vision for a good life uh, for their kids with disabilities. So uh, Genia will talk a little bit more about that. So without any further ado, let's welcome on Genia Steven. Hi, Genia. Welcome to the Empowering Ability Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks so much, Eric. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm excited. Yeah. So I've been listening to your new podcast that you've launched, uh, the good things in life podcast really enjoyed that. So we'll make sure to link to it in, in the show notes, um, of the, of this episode today on, uh, empowering ability. And uh, I mean, there's so many things that we can talk about, uh, Genia, but I think we're, what would be a good starting point, maybe if you could share, your story. So your story uh, as a as a sibling. So having a, a sibling with a developmental disability, and also as a mother um, having um, a son with a developmental disability. So maybe if you could start us off, just sharing your story, your experience, and then um, we can use that as a jumping off point to talk about um, some of the the things that we um, both share and appreciate, such as social role valorization and and some of the components within that. 
Yeah, great. Sure. So I um, am the third of four daughters, and my younger sister, uh, Kate, has a developmental disability. Kate's um, about three years younger than I am. And um, my sisters are, my older sisters, excuse me, are just a little bit older, you know, not not a huge amount older, but there was sort of a gap there. So Kate and I, when we were quite young, were really, it was the two of us. And I remember um when she was just like really quite small, um, we, we would go to these places and we would have all kinds of appointments and they would, um, uh, they would make Kate do all, they would ask Kate to do all these really silly things. Like one of the things that they, um, had her do, I remember is that uh, somebody would hand her a pencil and they would tell her to hold on tight to the pencil and then they would pull it out of her hand and, um, and she would let it go. And, um, and this was all um, I found it later, um, and certainly in retrospect, I can I can see it a lot more clearly than at the time. But this was all part of this sort of testing because my parents had noticed that Kate wasn't um, developing uh, her skills at the same um, pace as their other kids had, and so there was this you know pretty intensive period of months and months of of having Kate tested, and so. Um, I remember that period of time as being actually kind of fun. Um, you know, there was games and they would often bring me in to play with Kate, you know, to bring a peer in to, to play so that they could observe Kate. So we would, you know, play with puzzles and toys and then they would get Kate to do all these silly things. And I remember them talking to my parents about Kate having um, no strength um, or, or poor tone in her hands. And, um, and I, Kate and I thought that was very funny um, because at home, Kate would grab me by the big toes and drag me around our living room while our dog, Jenny, licked my face. And this was like <laughs> a game that happened all the time. So, um, but Kate had zero interest in, in holding on to this pencil. Um, in this, you know, in this environment of testing. And so, you know, when they said, hold on to the pencil, she would hold it and then they would t take it away and she would give it to them. I'm like, I don't care. Take the pencil. I don't want it. I'd rather go play with my sister. So this is sort of like my, some of my earliest experiences of um, disconnect between, um, between what, what was um, for my, for my parents and for those professionals quite, um, um, you know, serious, uh, situation, um, an important situation and the experience for Kate and I of, uh, you know, just being together, um, and, and being in relationship. And I remember, um, I was five at the time, um, sitting down, my mom brought me into our kitchen and she sat me down on her lap and she told me, um, I guess I'm assuming after all of this testing was done, um, telling me that Kate um, had a, a disability. And she was very, very serious. Like this was a, this was an occasion, you know, like she was sitting me down to talk to me about this. This was an occasion. And she explained um, that uh, having a disability like Kate had meant that she was going to learn slower than, than other kids. She could, she would still learn, but she would learn more slowly. And, um, and, uh, so I responded, um, by crying. And I remember this so very clearly because, uh, I remember sitting on my mother's lap and, um, trying to figure out what was expected of me in this situation because I couldn't quite figure out exactly what the problem was. And so, and it was, it was very clear to me that the appropriate response was to be sad about this. And so I did that and, um, my, my mom comforted me and then Kate and I went along our merry way, you know, and it, and that memory has really stuck with me that, that five-year-old knowing that for my mom, this was a big deal, but uh, for myself and in my relationship with my sister, um, this was this was a non-issue. Um, and so, you know, my mom, just to sort of give her some some credit here and, and context here, um, my mom had never met somebody with a disability um, when she was figuring out that that Kate had a disability. Uh, she'd never spent any time with people. 
Um, people with disabilities weren't in her schools, they weren't in her workplaces, they weren't in her community. So she really um, had no idea. And she was quite understandably uh, terrified um, and incredibly intimidated and incredibly overwhelmed. Um, and uh, and so this this was something worth crying about for her. So, um, you know, fast forward, not very long uh, into the future. And my mom was, um, I guess, smart enough and lucky enough to seek out uh, other parents and um, other people that um, knew more than she did and did know people with disabilities and uh, who thought that uh, people with disabilities were, um, you know, pretty good and cool and wanted them to have good lives. And she surrounded herself with that community and she just exploded into um, a very, very uh, clear and powerful advocate. And, um, and so she stopped, you know, she stopped uh, very quickly being the person who was um, delivering this information to people in a way that elicited sadness and uh, started um, really having very high expectations and real um, she's just a real powerhouse. And, and some of the people that she got connected with um, were people who had worked with Dr. Wolf Wolfensberger uh, and, and other academics in the field of uh, what was then called um, still at that time called mental retardation. And, um, and Dr. Wolf Wolfensberger uh, developed a, um, uh, social science theory called social world valorization. And when I was 15, I started attending social world valorization um, workshops and trainings and, and other trainings offered by uh, Wolf Wolfensberger and, um, um, and his colleagues. And in many ways, those initial workshops um, were really powerful because they gave me words to describe something I already understood and then were also life-changing because they really taught me about the way the world works for people who are vulnerable and devalued and what um, what we can do in order to help people to um, access the good things in life. So, um, over the years, I spent quite a bit of time learning and um, being in community with people with disabilities, uh, you know, my sister, obviously, but others as well, and, and um, in community with people who cared about people with disabilities. Um, and when uh, my second son, Will, was born, um, and he was very, very sick when he was born, we weren't sure that he was going to make it, uh, and um, and it was a really obviously very, um, very difficult time because we were very afraid for him. Um, I know my experience of, of having somebody say, uh, you know, your, your child has a disability was, was really quite dramatically different than, um, than many, than my mom, you know, and that, that many other people who have never had a chance to know people with disabilities. Um, and they were telling me that, you know, he he was going to um, have significant disabilities. Uh, at that point, it was it was a little bit of a like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but is he going to make it like let's focus on let's focus on what matters here, you know, um, and he did. And so um, he did partially because of excellent medical care. And I think also partially because uh, we had right from the very start a really clear um, vision of um, what we wanted Will's life to be. And we, we also had community around us that could help us to hold that vision, well, to build it, to hold it, to repair it when, when things were difficult and, and our vision was being kind of chipped away at. Um, and to help me, um, to help hold me accountable also to that vision um, and to help me hold clarity around that vision and that's kind of in a nutshell that's my it's where we came from where i came from yeah thank you for sharing your story genia there's a, a couple of things that um resonated 
with me that I that I wanted to pull out uh, of your story. And um, one was around your mom and your reflections about your mom and how she had never met an individual with a, a disability or a d- developmental disability, and then and then she has uh, a daughter with uh mm-hmm. she has kate with a developmental disability right and so I, I can imagine what that experience would be like for her i i, I don't truly understand that because i've never lived it but i can imagine what that would be like and uh the grief associated with that and there's i guess there's kind of two paths that you could take there as a as a parent you could say okay this is mine to to figure out and i'm going to do that and i'm gonna gonna do it my own way and i'm gonna no one no one else knows how to solve this and i'm gonna do it myself so that's one path and the other path is okay i'm you know i'm experiencing grief about this it's hard to talk about but i'm gonna go talk about it i'm gonna find others that will talk about it with me and others that are living similar experiences and I think eventually most parents find that path of, you know, talking about it and hearing about the experiences from other families and what they've done, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and learning from, from others. And it takes the amount of time that it takes a parent to do that differs. But it sounds like your mom did that really early mm-hmm. and it was very beneficial um it sounds like she was fortunate to connect with some um really uh forward thinking and and leading edge people to to lead to you know wolf wolfensburg and social role valorization and that's had a big impact on your life and your family's life um but i just found that really interesting kind of that that decision to um i guess engage and, and and go help go kind of seek help or go seek um conversation versus i'm just going to do this myself i think um sorry sorry that i'm pausing the dead space here but i i think it's an an important narrative that you're you're bringing up i guess i think i'm sure my mom did experience grief and um but i i think the thing that now I'm really speaking on her behalf, which I'm really not comfortable. I'm not comfortable with this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And my mom can get me in trouble later. But um, <laughs> sorry, mom. I uh, yeah, sorry, mom. Um, we may need a postscript on this if I get it all wrong. I think that one of the important things that was an impediment for my mom and is an impediment, I believe at least at moments for every parent of a child with a, with a disability is fear. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I, I really want to do my own podcast episode one day on grief and why I really, really want people to really get back over it super fast, basically because all the good things in life are on the other side of that. But then there's also this other narrative that I don't think goes away um, which is fear. And that's sort of an interesting topic in of itself, uh, how parents adaptively deal with fear. And, you know, the grief, I think, I think the grief is contextual or, or so, sort of societal, you know, if we had a different, um, if we had a different understanding and belief and mindset around disability, the grief would probably, um, you know, really, not exist or be different or less or something, but the fear, at least within the context of devaluation of people with disabilities in our society, that that's valid. You know, like we, we, it's not sort of a ridiculous fear. It's, it's a reasonable fear. Um, and, but then you, then you brought, you know, connected with, with other people and that. I think is just so critical. And I think it's not just critical that people get connected. 
I think it really matters who they get connected with and what the beliefs and mindsets are of the community that they involve themselves in. So we can see this really clearly now um, because we've we've got the internet and and social media where it's all out there sort of publicly for us to see. Whereas when my mom was doing this, um, there was less transparency and visibility because it was all just person to person and, you know, paper newsletters and who you looked up in the yellow pages, which for people who are, um, you know, younger, the yellow pages was the original phone book, <laughs> um, the original Google. Um so who you end up getting connected with, I think, has a very significant um, impact on how how quickly you get over grief if you're experiencing it and um, how you deal with your fear. Because I think how you deal with fear uh, is really um, guided by by your mindsets, your beliefs and your vision for what someone's life should be. So, for example, if your um, if your vision for somebody uh, is that they remain, uh, if your if your major fear is that somebody is going to be hurt or rejected, and your mindset and um, and belief is that the way that you prevent that is by keeping people protected and isolated um, from the people that might hurt them, then that leads you down a particular. Uh, path towards a, a vision of what life is like, you know, and that vision likely includes um, a lot of services and paid, people paid to keep the person um, safe. If your um, if your mindset and belief is that safety for people that are vulnerable to rejection lies in in deep and meaningful unpaid relationships, then um, then that really leads you towards a vision of life and community, and. Um, both those pathways come with risk. Um, unfortunately, those um, there, there's no risk-free. There's no. Well, I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, but the truth is, there's no risk-free path. Right. Um, but uh, you know, wh- which path you end up on is likely to determine where you end up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And my perspective on the grief piece is that it's not disability specifically disability related it's you expected one outcome you expected to have this beautiful healthy child and you're what happened in actuality is different so you you know you you still have a beautiful child but you know maybe there's a medical condition or some sort of disability that you learn about so it's it's uh it's different than what you expected and and you feel like there's some sort of loss within that. Um, So I don't know if it's necessarily societal related. I'm I'm sure there's a component of that, but the perspective that I have on it is there's some sort of, there's a difference in the outcome that you expected. And there's a, you had this picture of your, in your mind of what your child was going to look like. And now there's a different, different, picture that you need to adjust to and that Mm -hmm. takes some time Mm -hmm. again i haven't experienced this as a parent so but this is kind of how i'm thinking about it yeah i just i i hear you and i think that what you're saying is true in so far as very significant when our life pivots unexpectedly there's definitely a transitional time often experienced by people that is uncomfortable um you know, we don't, humans don't generally love major changes that they didn't anticipate and that they didn't ask for. Even when we ask for them, they're stressful, you know? So, um, so I hear you, but I, I do believe that devaluation of people with disabilities in our culture, largely unconscious devaluation of people in our culture absolutely affects parent parents experience of grief and you know I even myself you know I said my experience when they were first telling me that Will had a disability was was very different and it and it was but you know just as a you know as a sort of fully transparent follow-up to that I at some point later in his hospital stay when he was um just newborn uh the the genetics team came to talk to us and I don't even know why they were there because I 
I, I, I'm not sure why I would have uh, wanted to speak with them, but anyway, they were there and they did, um, they did a full head to toe exam and, um, they decided that they thought that Will had a particular genetic condition. And because they knew that I had a background in healthcare, they gave me all of the information about this syndrome for healthcare providers. So it wasn't, wasn't prettied up, you know, like the, the stuff that parents often get, even though the, the stuff parents get is often not very pretty either. But anyway, it was, it, you know, it was really pretty raw. And then uh, they left. And so I read through this material and, um, and it said, you know, people with this condition are, uh, you know, they have stunted growth, um, moderate to severe mental retardation. Um, they have, uh, they experience um, early balding. Um, they have some spinal um, issues that can cause curvatures. Uh, they are um, at increased risk compared to the general population of cancer. Um, and, uh, there were, there were, I mean, there was a bunch of other things. Anyway, I was devastated, like just devastated. And I called my mom and you know, when you're crying so hard that half the time you're not making any noise and the other half you're wailing and nothing you say makes sense. Like maybe yeah. you've never cried like that, but you know what I mean? Yeah, like that, yeah. like I was so hysterically um, distraught by this because basically what they had said is, you know, my, my sweet little, um, baby was going to, oh, and over, overweight was another one. So he was going to grow up to be short, fat, bald, stupid, and cancer ridden with a crooked spine. Basically my kid was going to grow up to be Quasimodo. Like that's, that's how I, that's the image you, you know, had that's in your what head. That's, that's the image that I had in my head. And I called my mom and she couldn't like, she, she couldn't understand what I was trying to tell her. And I finally got it out. And she said, Oh, for heaven's sakes, Genia, I thought he was dying from your reaction. <laughs> and, and it, you know, it was not um, the reaction that I expected or that I hoped for. <laughs> you know, I was quite offended, you know, and felt like she clearly didn't understand the implications of what I was saying. Um, but of course, she, she did understand she, she understood perfectly um and and when she said that it really snapped me back you know in into myself um in in for a number of different reasons um you know partially it was like right this is um you know this is a sort of medical model um way of talking about a person it's not the whole person and you know right this material also comes from a, from a ton of research based on people living a life of institutionalization where they're not achieving their full potential and so this is you know irrelevant to um what can be expected today and um and all of those things but the other thing that it very clearly um brought to my consciousness is that you know that that deep unconscious devaluation of Quasimodo is um, it, it's there in us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can pretend it's not, and we can suppress it. And it's not a very pretty reality for us to talk about, but it's, I think a really important one. If, if we want our kids to have um, good lives, you know, is, is to recognize that people with disabilities are devalued in our culture largely that happens unconsciously in people's minds. Um, but that what's in our minds unconsciously finds space for expression. And you can see that you can see that expression in the way people with disabilities are treated in our culture. So I think the grief has more, I, th I think the grief is about transition from what you were expecting or to, you know, when transition when you find out something that you weren't expecting about your kid but i think that devaluation plays an important role in that as well mm -hmm. yeah i i appreciate your perspective on that and it might not be as obvious or transparent to us but that's you've just explained that underlying devaluation and how that's programmed into our subconscious um for most of us uh, some of us are conscious of, of it but 
um, for a lot of us, it's we're unconscious to it, um, and that's that's laying there in the background, um, and overlaying on our experiences. So, um, I, I agree with you on that, Genia. There was two other points in time that uh, I would, from your story that I would like to explore. You mentioned that that talk, right? So your mom calls you in for the the talk. <laughs> And it, as a kid, it's never good when it's, we need to have a conversation. No, it's true. <laughs> right. So. I still get nervous when my mom says, can we talk? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so from my experience um, as a kid or a toddler, I, I never had that talk uh, that I can remember anyways about uh, my sister, Sarah, who has a developmental disability. I, I think of if my parents had that talk with me, then I probably would remember it. Um, I mean, granted my sister is, uh, two and a half, almost three years older than, than I am. Um, and my parents had learned, I think a lot about my sister's disability and, um, development and whatnot before I had, I was born, but that might be part of the, the reason where there was no talk, but um, it sounded like you were searching f- when you, when your mom had that talk with you, you were searching for how to react and, and how to understand it, um, which is understandable just from the age of, I think you said you were five, um, or so. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's obviously a lot for a five-year-old to try and logically comprehend what that means. Um, and it sounds like you kind of just, you know, you were you acted how you thought you were supposed to act, you know, which was sad. And then you went about your merry way and and having your relationship with your sister. I'm just curious, did that have lingering effects for you? Um, One, and then I guess two, um, if you were to see a family in a similar situation and a mother was going to have the talk with, um, with the other siblings, what would you suggest that talk to, to look like? So to answer your first question, I don't, I don't know if that had any lingering effects on me. I mean, probably in some way, but I think my mom experienced such a transformation so quickly that it was more the anomaly rather than the, than the foundation. Um, and, um, and as far as what I would suggest for other um, parents, I think, I think that kids are, are experiencing most of the, like young children are experiencing most of the world uh, as new. And, and so they have no context really for understanding what new and magical reality is particularly surprising and which is mundane, you know, cause it's all pretty new and surprising, you know? Um, and so I think just being really matter of fact about all of these things sets a precedence for understanding that disability is matter of fact, you know, disability is a part of the human experience. Uh, if somebody isn't currently identified as having a disability, they, they will at some point in their life, um, unless they die before him. And so, um, you know, I think just matter of fact is, uh, really healthy and appropriate, which is probably true for most of the conversations and, you know, most of the important conversations we have, um, with our, with our kids when we're explaining the way the world works, how yeah. people work. Yeah. So it sounds like your suggestion is not to be avoidant or to not have the talk, but to just state the facts, um, this is what it is and and to explain that and then, you know, likely to answer any questions and, and be supportive um, through that conversation. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I, beyond saying, I think that matter of fact is a good way to go. I hesitate to get more specific um, because I think, um, you know, there are as many good ways to parent as there are, parents but generally i would say a lot of kids i think when when disability is is 
normalized within family life, they figure out what they need to know when they need to know it. And so I don't know that, um, I don't know that the sit down and have a conversation piece is, is always required. Maybe for, maybe in some, I'm sure in some families it's appropriate and required. And I, I also know just again, to give my mom some credit, my mom always treated me with a tremendous amount of, um, respect for, uh, sort of my, my personhood, you know, so this was an event for her and my dad. And so I think from her perspective, sharing it with me was, um, was a sort of very respectful thing to do. I'm not sure it was necessary. I don't, you know, I don't think it mm-hmm. was necessarily, but, and I don't know that it is for many families, but for some, it, it might be the right thing to do, but certainly answering questions matter of factly. And, uh, and I think when um, there, I think there may be some, some utility or helpfulness when kids are going off into the world together uh, for s- things like school, for example, uh, to have some context and understanding for the for siblings, I think can be helpful. But what that looks like, you know, is need, those decisions need to be made within the context of the family and the community and the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, and I think the acknowledgement piece is important. I think also as things come up, to talk about them rather than to just not talk about them or ignore them um, is important. Like, yeah, I, absolutely. I think about my mm. experience growing up. And, you know, I treated my sister as any other sibling would treat their sister or brother. You know, we played together, we fought together, we cried together, we laughed together, right? We did all those things. And um, I, I, I mean, one of my memories, or I, probably my earliest memory of the realization that my sister was different than other kids um, or perceived as different than other kids was when I was pushing her in the mall, so my mom would take uh, uh, us shopping to get clothes or groceries or whatnot um, with her on a weekly basis. And um, in this instance, we were in the mall and I was pushing my sister, uh, who would have been 10 or 11 at the time. Um, I was eight. And um, my, for whatever reason, I haven't asked, uh, I guess maybe this is part of the communication challenges within my own family, but we, uh, my sister had a a stroller, um, not a wheelchair. So Mm -hmm. there's this big kid, right? Like my sister, you know, physically developed Mm -hmm. uh, as typical. And uh, so there's an 11 year old kid in a stroller, which isn't normative. And you know, all the other kids would look and they would stare and and whatnot. And that's when I really realized that my sister, um, there was, you know, there was differences between my sister and, um, and others. And, you know, I'd be, I was the defensive brother sticking my tongue out or, you know, sticking my nose up and giving other kids dirty looks, right? Because um, she was my sister and you don't look at her that way. But, you know, it was just normal reaction from a kid just not understanding or oh i haven't seen that before that's different um Mm -hmm. but i think conversation from my parents would have been likely helpful for me to gain understanding in in that um Mm -hmm. in that situation um so there's one other point in your story that i wanted to um jump to and you mentioned you took your first srv social role valorization course at 15 so I don't know how many 15 year olds have taken an SRV course, but I'm going to imagine you're in limited company with that. So with the work that I do with the sibling collaborative, so uh, I get talking to a lot of, uh, a lot of siblings and Mm -hmm. one of the common themes that come up is that if you have a brother or sister with a um, developmental disability, you tend to, mature faster um, than your peer group and that can look different in uh, in it can look different for different people and some people it might be okay I'm just going to stay out of trouble because there's a lot of energy that my parents expend to care for my siblings so I don't want to cause any more trouble or you know I don't want to cause any issues for the family so I'm just you know going to be a straight a student or i'm not going to experiment with drugs and alcohol or whatever that looks like or it could be i'm going to jump in and i'm going to provide some care for my sibling or it could Mm -hmm. look like 
you know, I'm going to get involved and I'm going to take an SRV course at 15. Um, so I just, what's your perspective in, in, from your sibling experience as a sibling? Did you feel that you had matured faster than, than your peer group? Um, and how did, if yes, how did that show up for you? Yeah, I, I was really interested in, um, in hearing about that research finding. Uh, because I'd never considered it really before. And certainly, you know, your research is, is recent. So I haven't had, you know, there wasn't previously an opportunity to, to reflect on that. I think I, I did in many ways mature young. Um, but I kind of feel like I've always been in my forties and now in my forty that I'm in my forties, I've finally just arrived where I've always been. So, mm. um, I don't know whether it's just, you know, just me, um, or whether it's specific to, um, to my experience of having Kate as my sibling, I, I suspect it has to do with a lot, um, a, you know, a number of variables and, you know, by the time I was 15, I was already involved in, I'm just double guessing my timing. I know I went to my first SRV related workshop when I was 15, but I might've been 16 or 17 by the time I was working, um, volunteering with a a peer organization and running conferences. And, you know, that was sort of my jam anyway. Uh, so it wasn't a big stretch. And I don't think I, I don't think I actively was like, Oh, I think I'll, the best thing for me to do with my time is to go to a workshop. I think my mom just told me that, I should, I, she wanted me to go and I was open to that. Now I have a 15 year old son. It's totally not his jam. You know, like I'm not, I'm not getting him to attend SRV workshops right now. I would love it if he wanted to, and if he was, um, interested and, but I don't, I don't think that's going to be his path. It's, it's not where his passion lays. So I don't know that just by the the simple uh, reality of having a sibling with um, a disability that one matures particularly early, um, not to malign my 15-year-old's maturity, of course, but I do think for sure it gives you opportunities for clarity about the world that you may not otherwise have at such a young age age Mm -hmm. i definitely think that that's true yeah for sure and i suppose that that fosters a certain amount of maturity like you're grappling you're grappling with some truths about about um discrimination and marginalization and um devaluation um and uh and i i think that that can foster maturity I also, you know, it would be interesting to look at the broader research around um, whether um, children of color in North America, it, you know, mature more quickly in the same ways. Yeah. Because we're certainly, you know, siblings of people with disabilities don't have the exclusive um, rights to being able to perceive the world in, um, you, you know, these, these realities about the world. Um, or, you know, I think about young black men, uh, right now and their, um, significantly increased chances of being shot, you know, like that, that it's not just what you perceive, but it's also your experience of where you need to, to step up in the world or how you might want to consider stepping up in the world as certainly not in any way exclusive, um, or even, I don't even think we're a particularly great case study group. You know what I mean? For, yeah, yeah. for, for, for that. Yeah. I haven't looked at any research in terms of other marginalized groups, um, or, you know, people of color, for example, um, in terms of the, and I don't know if I have any hard evidence to prove this, but I would say from the, it's probably pretty close to hundreds of conversations that I've had with adult siblings. I, I, I'm confident to say that the experiences that you have when you have a sibling with a developmental disability opens your eyes to 
the human experience and the variability within the human experience and allows you to, to um, I guess, exposes you to opportunities to, to gain more compassion. I agree. And mm-hmm. um, I think, I don't know if I were to guess, if I were to hypothesize, if you expand that to uh, marginal groups of people that are marginalized or devalued and you experience that, at a young age, um, my hypothesis would be that you have a greater understanding of the human experience, um, and not just a privileged view of, um, of the human experience, but, Mm um, yeah. So Mm -hmm. I, I guess in terms of one thing that I'd be really interested to hear, um, from your perspective is, so obviously from a young age, you had the interest of learning about um, things like SRV, so social role valorization. And mm-hmm. I'm curious how that has manifested either in your sister's life or in Will's life. So could you maybe provide a couple of examples of how you took that SRV theory and how you've um, how that's manifested in your family's uh, lives. Yes. So, so social role valorization. Um, it, the introductory workshop to social role valorization is taught over four very full long days. So I feel like any examples I give are uh, certainly going to be really superficial. Um, in the context of, you know, like how much we can talk about here today. But um, so, so social role valorization um, talks about some of the universal experiences of people that are devalued in society. And, um, and, and that's a, you know, very lengthy presentation of of content. Um, But one can, one can say for the purposes of this conversation that people that are devalued in society are generally not given the opportunities to access the good things in life that valued citizens are given. So, um, for example, it's more difficult for people that are devalued to um, have the same opportunities or people don't have the same opportunities for personal growth, education, um, meaningful work, freely paid or freely given, excuse me, relationships, um, pursuing their interests, uh, you know, all of those good things in life and social role valorization posits that one of the most powerful ways that people do access opportunities for the good things in life are through our social roles. So not just the tasks and activities that we do, but the, the roles that we play in society. And, um, so, you know, and we see we, we, that's how also how we connect and, and understand each other. So, for example, if you meet somebody at um, a party, you know, one of the first things they're likely to ask you is, uh, you know, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Um, because if you're trying to understand who somebody is, understanding their some of their positive valued social roles really gives you some insight into who they are. And it provides you a platform um upon which you can relate to each other when you're uh, speaking with a child that you've just met. I mean, this happens to my kids in the grocery store standing in line, you know, somebody will say, Oh, you know, you're on Christmas break. Um, what grade are you in? You know, this, this connection over the role of student is one of those primary introductory conversation kinds of uh, ways that we relate to each other. So, um, you know, one of the things that we have um, done in my son's life is really think about for his stage of life. So right now he's 12. So, you know, we haven't done any of the, we're not looking at um, getting further into the teen years and and adult roles um, yet, although we're preparing for those, but throughout his life, we thought, well, for his peer group at whatever age he is, what are the typical valued social roles that, that those children hold? And, what are the kinds of opportunities that those roles bring? And then we pursue those things. So um, that that hasn't always been easy. 
But when Will was very young, when he was preschool, he was still quite um, very often very sick and and had quite a lot of medical complexity. And he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't physically well enough, healthy enough to go to to preschool, for example, as one of the things that, you know, being a preschool student is one of the things that often is, um, often happens for kids. Um, and, but not always, and not all kids go to preschool. It's not like there's one answer to this for, for anybody. There never is only one answer to this. But what we were looking at was, um, the role of student later in Will's life. And we knew that, uh, we know that for the vast majority of children, the role is their primary access to um, the good things in life. It's their primary access to quality education, their primary access to friendships, to personal growth, those things in our society. Again, there are options uh, and, and differences, but the primary role for young children is is student. So we're looking towards student and trying to think about, well, what are the ways that Will can um, that we can help Will to prepare to be a, a successful student with all the goodness that that will bring into his life, and so when he was two, we enrolled him in the preschool that was attached to his school, and um, his um, be, because Will we, we the sorry. I'm starting to stammer a little bit as I have multiple thoughts running through my head. So we were looking at student. We wanted to backtrack that and think, so in two years, if he's going to be ready for being a student and if he's likely, if we can do things that are likely to increase people's high expectation and positive image of Will as a student, what do we need to do now at the age of two? So he wasn't well enough to go to that preschool all of the time. So we just did what we could, which was two days a week. He went for two hours. And at the age of two, the differences between Will and his peers were far less noticeable than they were when he was four and even less noticeable now that he's 12. And so it was a much easier way for him to get to know those kids when the differences weren't as obvious and also a lot easier for the um, for the staff, both in the preschool, but because it was attached to his future school um, and there was lots of interaction between the preschool and the school. It was also an opportunity for his future teachers to see him, this adorable little toddler, get to know him a little bit and and sort of just have this positive image of Will in their minds when he went um, into kindergarten. And we also chose his school very carefully and intentionally. So he attends the only French language school in our community. And it's attached to the Ottawa board, which is about everything else is about an hour away. So the board is not super involved um, on the day to day at the school level because there's a bit of a distance there. Um, The French school is a school where um, that's quite small. It goes from junior kindergarten all the way to grade 12. So we knew that he would be known throughout. He wouldn't have to transition to high school. Um, We uh, knew that no other child with very significant disabilities had ever attended this small school. Um, And so we didn't, we weren't going to have to help the staff to unlearn a bunch of stuff that had been done previously. And the distance from the board kind of helped with that because they couldn't bring in all of the board resources and all of the sort of segregation and congregation that was prevalent within the school board at the, at the time. Um, so by the time Will entered high school, he was known by his kindergarten teacher. Uh, he was seen positively by the kindergarten teacher and the other people in the school. All the children in his kindergarten class, save perhaps one or two that had moved into the community, had known Will already for two years. And so Will was, was already um, in that friend role with them in kindergarten. And so that made his transition to student um, really much easier than it would have been. The other piece was that those all that the staff all talk, right? They they chat here and there. So Will had some medical complexity that made people really really nervous. Um, but because he'd already been in the preschool and the preschool staff had managed that and it had been okay, you know, there had been this repetitive positive experience of of no no major um, problems. Uh, 
people were more comfortable when he started kindergarten. And so it was a much easier transition. Um, and there were, I, I was sort of pausing there when I was talking about mo, no major problems. We did have some, some medical issues that came up, but we were, we were able to, um, support the staff through that and, and figure that out. And so it didn't feel like a major crisis, even when there were significant problems. So that's one example. And then, um, you know, another, I'll try to be more brief, but another example is, um, you know, as Will got, um, got older, his friends started, um, you know, playing, playing sports and the, the primacy of the school relationships wasn't as strong, you know, kids were starting to be friends with people outside of school. So, you know, we started thinking about, um, you know, what Will likes, um, and what he's interested in and what he really likes is high energy activity. Like he's, he's a real kind of go getter, um, really likes, lots of excitement and movement and, and energy. And so, um, we thought, well, I think we would really like to play soccer. Now, Will uses a wheelchair and, um, has a hard time moderating his, his movements. So we knew that he wasn't going to be able to, um, to do a lot of the aspects of being a soccer player, but he had support from somebody who knew soccer really well and who knew what it meant to be both a soccer player, but also a team member. And so because of, we under, because we had, you know, we've, we studied social rule valorization, which talks about how to break down a social rule and understand the, the um, various parts of a social rule um, that help us grow into roles and that help other people to perceive us as being in those roles. Um, things like what are the activities and what are the um, what do people in that role look like and how do they spend their time and um, what language do they use? And there's, there's all kinds of um, really helpful content there. We were able to help Will to join a soccer team the, in, in our local um, soccer league. And uh, we had support from, Will had support from somebody who had played soccer, knew the sport well, is an athlete himself, and so understands that sort of team, um, what it means to be a team member and team spirit, and so was really able to help Will to fully fill as much of that role of being a soccer player as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, Will's now going on to his third season um, of, of playing soccer, and it's been really been really positive for him um and and really powerful and of course through through team um sports and through being a team member you also then get access to other valued social roles and good things in life like friendships and that's been um playing soccer has been really powerful for will for giving him you know opportunities to build friendships and and he has yeah those are great examples genia and you're right there's there's so much more to unpack there in terms of the theory of social role valorization and the thinking that you, you went through to, um, to think about those roles and to break them down into different components and how to support will in living into those roles. So there's, I mean, we could probably have an hour long conversation just talking mm-hmm. about all of, like breaking down those, those roles and that decision-making. Um, but to me, it was, it was clear that the, you know, thinking about a vision for, for will, right. I mean, it's, it sounds like it wasn't an accident that you picked the uh, preschool connected to the school that was um, that hadn't had individuals with an individual with a dis- doesn't didn't currently have an individual with a disability that was being supported there, and they didn't have preset expectations and support in place. So it sounds like you know you were you had that vision in terms of okay, we think Will could live into the role of a student. We think this is what we could, what it could look like. This is the best place for Will to, to be. And this is how we can coach, um, and mentor 
the teachers and the supporters in a way that will allow Will to live into that role. So there's a lot of thinking and vision that goes into into that. Um, so I thought it was cool how how you did that, but also shared that with your story. And then um, I think it was also I think one of the important things there was to think about okay, what's the next role, and what can you do mm-hmm. now to help that individual live into that role. Um, the, and one of the other important things I think you mentioned was the, the unlearning that might need to be done if there was, um, people there that had been trained or worked with others that have a disability. Um, I don't think we have time to, to dive too deeply into that, but I think thinking outside of the box with support and thinking about what's the, what does the individual want to achieve? What's the role that they're looking to build and who would be the best person to do that? So with the, um, with the soccer example, if Will's working towards, if, if Will's living into the role of being a soccer member or soccer player and a team member, then a support person who's a soccer player and a team member is probably the best person to support Will versus a, PSW, for example. Uh, absolutely. I think, just, yes, absolutely. And this is a tough one for, for um, lots of families, myself included, because we, we, you know, we want people who can be with, uh, who we want people to support our kids who we, who we trust and who we feel they will, with whom they'll be safe. And of course that has to be true. That, that has to be true that you trust that the person is being supported well and safely. But we often do defer to the person who we relate to, you know, like I'm, I'm likely to defer to the, you know, 40 year old educational assistant who I can connect with um, and feel trust in um, when I'm thinking about, you know, who to hire in the summer, for example. But if, if we want our sons and daughters to be filling social roles uh, and they need support to do so, the person who's supporting them needs to understand what that role is mm-hmm. and, and, and have also the social currency to, to help get them there. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. And I think the only thing I want to add, um, Eric, about the, the piece around vision is that I think one of the really, really key things is where you look to find the vision. And I think, uh, it's really critical that one looks to what's happening for people who don't have a disability in typical life, in typical community at, at that stage in life. Mm -hmm. That's the place to look for the vision, not what's happening for, you know, other kids with abilities or impairments or, um, you know, not look to uh, necessarily the IEP or the, you know, it's, it's really what's, what are, what are the ways in which people of that age or stage in life are accessing the good things in life? And what does the good things in life mean at that age or stage in life? I couldn't agree more. Genia, it was a pleasure chatting with you today. And I really appreciated you sharing your story and allowing me to, to dig into elements of your story and, um, and talking about your examples as well. So I'm grateful that you, you shared it and, um, grateful for the, the work that, that you do and, and that you're, you're doing now. Would you be able to, to share with listeners where they can learn more about what you're working on and maybe if you can provide uh, a high level overview of that and, um, and how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. So if people are interested in um, checking out what, what Will is doing, you can connect with his um, social media platforms, which we haven't talked about, but it's one of the ways that he keeps in touch with his friends um, at at the adventures of will.ca. And there are links there to his, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube accounts. And um, I am currently working on the Good Things in Life, which is a online um, platform for parents of young children with intellectual disabilities, helping parents to help their kids grow a good life. And you can find that at goodthingsinlife.org. 
there's a podcast, a good, as you mentioned, the Good Things in Life podcast, which you can connect to on the website or on uh, iTunes or Google Play or whatever your favorite podcast platform is. And if you're interested in emailing me directly, you can email me at genia at goodthingsinlife.org or find me on Facebook or Instagram. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Genia. And uh, I'm, Thank sure, you, I'm sure we'll be having more conversations, so I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thanks so much. A big thank you to Genia Steven for joining me on the podcast today. And again, congrats on launching your podcast, uh, The Good Things in Life. Uh, so listeners, feel free to check that out um, on iTunes or whatever podcast app that you listen to. Uh, so uh, I think for me, the big thing from this conversation with Genia is just the solidification. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but just the reinforcement that focusing on roles, so valued social roles for people that are devalued and marginalized, is a proven pathway to help them to get the good things in life. So whatever you know, those might be that you're considering, uh, you know, such as pursuing our interests. Uh, you know, having continuous growth or personal growth and development, uh, f- forming freely given relationships, having a job, having a reason to jump out of bed in the morning and be excited, uh, getting a volunteer role, being a contributing mem- member of your family. So really starting from that role, there's so many things that can flow out of it. And there's a great podcast that I did with Janet Cleese, where she talks about a strategy to build those roles, uh, to build uh, valued social roles. So I'll share that in the show notes as well. Now, I want to ask all of you listeners a favor. I want to ask you to sign up and subscribe to the Empowering Ability podcast on your smartphone. So whether you have an Apple or an Android phone, you can do this. So if you have an Apple phone, it's just the podcast icon, the purple icon on your phone. Click on that and then type in empowering ability in the search, empowering ability in the search. And if you're on Android, any podcast app that you use, it could be Spotify or it could be Podbean or it could be Stitcher, whatever podcast app you're using. Just go to your podcast app and type in Empowering Ability and hit subscribe and new episodes will go directly to your phone. So this helps in terms of me getting you new episodes Um, and it helps to grow the it helps to grow Empowering Ability. So if you could stop what you're doing and go to your podcast app, type in Empowering Ability and hit subscribe, that would be incredible. Uh, I also want to remind you that you can subscribe. This is a different kind of subscribe. Subscribe to Empowering Ability by going to the website, empoweringability.org, and contributing your hard-earned dollars towards the development of new content, new episodes, new blogs, and the new paid content that is coming. You will get access to that by subscribing now. And you can select the level of subscription that you would like to uh, move forward with. So that's totally up to you what you would like to pay, but it's a huge benefit towards um, the development of this work, the continuation of this work. And it's also investment an investment in yourself, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. Uh, If you like this episode and you think you know someone that would benefit, please share it with them. Uh, be a part of the change to think differently about disability. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. Visit us at empoweringability.org for more podcasts and resources to help you and your loved ones impacted by disability live a full and meaningful life.